So leaders sometimes think it's just a magic tool that you plug in for every software automation problem, but it really isn't. It's for something very specific. Hi, Kavita. Welcome to the Bot Nirvana podcast. Uh, can we start with a quick personal intro about yourself? Um, so I am an AI consultant and uh, I've been practicing AI for a very long time now, since 2005, I would say. Uh -huh. And I've been on the academic research side of things and also on the uh, industry side of things, solving business problems. And currently I'm working with uh, different um, clients directly to help them integrate AI in their business. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And so uh, Kavita, uh, we came to know about you through your book, uh, the business case for ai right so right. congrats on that book it's it's I, I did go through it it's very well written thank, uh, thank you for such a contribution uh, because ai needs a lot of demystification right now mm -hmm. um, but from your side what was the motivation for writing this book um so having been in different roles like i've been doing research i've been in the weeds solving industry problems then i also work with clients who happen to be leaders, I've seen a lot of problems in the field that are preventing companies from actually integrating AI successfully. And these are problems that could be easily avoided. Okay. So I wanted something that I could give people that would serve as a bridge to the successful adoption of AI. Um, so for example, there's a big gap in understanding of what AI is at the implementation level versus what it is at the leadership level. So leaders sometimes think it's just a magic tool that you plug in for every software automation problem, but it really isn't. It's for something very specific. So my book doesn't assume that you already know AI. Uh, it starts with the very foundations of what is AI, what it means from a business perspective, and what are the use cases um, where you can apply it within your business. And then it goes into deeper concepts like how do I find these opportunities in my company? Um, how do I measure the value of AI? So a lot of the practical topics that you may already be thinking about. So it tries to address that. So, and it's also a way for me to give to some of my clients uh, before they start working with me. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So um, from working with your customers, right? Uh, so you said that, uh, there's a lot of misconception about AI and, you know, how it can be applied. Uh, so what are some common misconceptions that you're seeing? So one that I see very often is um, they develop an AI solution, like a software engineering problem. So it's developed and it's plugged in okay. and then it's expected to work. But that rarely happens. Um, you need to test the solutions and that's where that's a big piece that people miss that you need to test solutions when they go into production. or so even before deployment, you need to test it with actual customers because AI solutions are not deterministic. It can change based on the input data. Right. So that's a very common problem that I see. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, so they take, a solution which is available in the market and they think that that will work for them too, but it probably doesn't work with their data. Is that right? That's correct. That's one uh, way it happens. Another way is they actually hire data scientists to develop a model to solve a specific problem, maybe uh, let's say a sentiment analysis problem. Okay. So they develop it and then they test it in development. It looks okay. And okay. then they just plug it in and they think it's going to deliver okay. business results. But okay. there are two problems there. One is you don't know if the model is going to work with the actual data. The second problem is they have not measured the metrics that they are really interested in, the business side of things. Okay. So that's where they're like, hey, I've de deployed this thing. Now customers are complaining. So how do I resolve it? <laughs> okay. So that's a very common uh, situation I see clients in. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, so it's a lot of challenges, right? So, but there are some areas where, like you say, there's a business case for AI in the organizations right now, right? There is potential. So what do you think is the business case for AI right now? 
So I would say that two big areas. One is in trying to eliminate uh, inefficiencies within business processes. Okay. So like HR functions, customer service functions, and all of that. And the second is um, optimizing decision making. So what I mean by that is uh, currently a lot of businesses, they make decisions using uh, structured data. So mm -hmm. data that essentially fits in like Excel spreadsheets and just databases. And databases, yeah. Yeah, just like sales and profit numbers. So this is easy to analyze, but a lot of the hidden gold is in your unstructured data sources. And this is what most companies own, like uh, customer conversations, customer complaints, uh, employee complaints, uh, your employee engagement surveys. Um, and even data stored in cloud computing applications, which are not uh, in your local service, are usually unstructured in nature. And these data sources have a lot of gold in them. And in order to make sense of it, you will need AI. So you yeah. need a la layer of AI to help you maybe um, summarize those data points or maybe augment it, add additional information so it easily becomes more analyzable and some people even use it to like standardize this data so that you can analyze the data like you would um, from a database itself um, so let me give an example so let's say you've executed an employee engagement survey mm -hmm. and um, one of the questions you ask your employee is how can we make this a better place to work uh, so one guy may say give me more pay Somebody may say, uh, more salary, please. Or someone else may say, we are being paid poorly. So mm -hmm. all these expressions are different, yeah. but essentially mean the same thing. And you can't easily analyze this with just mm -hmm. database queries. This mm -hmm. is where uh, NLP, natural language processing, which is a sub area of AI, comes right. into play. So right. you can use it to standardize this data. Then it immediately becomes more analyzable. And you can make a lot of critical business decisions using that standardized data. Right, right. And yeah. I think you mentioned two things there. One is the whole unstructured data challenge, right? And mm -hmm. by some estimates, 80% of the data is unstructured. And the data that's available, yeah, is all transactional data or databases and Excel and things like that. So freeing up that Unstructured data is, I think, one major challenge, right? And uh, AI helps with that a lot, like you said. Uh, so, uh, you know, interesting that you say that because from an automation perspective, that's the single biggest problem that we have is uh, data. I mean, it's I, I would say not just from automation, just from, you know, mm -hmm. general going digital perspective. Uh, data is a problem. Unstructured data is we, what we come across. As soon as we start automating, we have a problem in terms of getting good data. Uh, and yeah. most of it unstructured data. And now this unstructured data, I mean, thanks to AI, we have we are at a place where we get fairly good data, uh, mm -hmm. depending on from where, what kind of unstructured document or things that there is. But still, we are not there 100%. You know, that's still a challenge. Uh, but I, I think AI is helping us solve the problem gradually. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so, and, and second thing you mentioned is about the whole semantics of the thing or, you know, understanding, understanding that language, right? Like you mentioned different ways that people can, men can say things in a survey, uh, like people, you know, raise tickets and then uh, the emails contain various ways people mention things and, you know, we're using NLP to do that. Uh, so I think, you know, there is that synergy between AI uh, and automation, uh, because I and our audience are a lot of an automation. So mm -hmm. AI and automation, there's a lot of synergies within AI and automation. And you know, it's, it's great to see that synergies and how we go about doing it. And when I say automation, you know, I just don't mean RPA. I mean, you know, the whole process automation. Yeah. Thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so from your perspective, since you have written this book uh, and you've mentioned so many use cases in it. And yeah, I did see a lot of the use cases. I would uh, encourage people to buy the book and look at the use cases. But can you uh, share with us a few you know, use cases which is uh, very promising, especially from an automation perspective? 
Yeah, so I think financial companies are really um, leveraging this is um, fraud detection. Right. So that's a really, really good use of AI because imagine credit card transaction um, fraud detection. So if you employ um, someone, they'll have to look at each and every transaction hmm. on a case by case basis. Correct. And you'll have to look like at a hundred data points, like what's the current purchase value, previous purchase values, uh, any anomalies, where the purchase was made. So all sorts of things. So this can take someone anywhere from five minutes to hours, but you can teach an AI system to do the same thing. Um, and this immediately cuts down the amount of work that the human will have to do. And this is a really great application of AI because a human will then just have to review the flagged transactions right? or maybe uh, transactions where the AI had trouble um, interpreting. Yeah. So this uh, this provides a real boost to like uh, revenues because companies are not losing money. And at the same time, uh, financial companies don't have to hire as many employees to manage these transactions. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a very powerful use of AI. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I've seen this in action, you know, nowadays I make a purchase. Uh, supposing I go, you know, to India and start purchasing things and immediately a fraud alert throws up and, you know, yeah. they block the card and then you can go to your app and, you know, so all things are automated and that fraud detection is uh, an especially useful area. And one more thing that comes to my mind is audit. You know, so earlier we used to have mm -hmm. people do audits and then you could only do a subset of the things as an audit. And because it's an audit, audit is meant to be just a subset and, you know, a sampling. But now you can actually do check everything 100%, like you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, because machines are doing it and they can just run 24 hours a day and keep checking. Yeah. So more, uh, more reduction in uh, errors too. Yeah, definitely. And another area I would say AI is really making a mark is in recommendation systems. Okay. So if you look at Amazon, if you take a product page on uh, Amazon, yeah, yeah, you have the main product Huge and impact. then you have two <laughs> to three different types of recommendations. Correct. You have similar items. You have customers who bought this item, also bought that item. Then you have things based on your taste recommendations. So the person may buy the original item along with a few other recommended items. Yeah. Or if they don't like the original item, they'll go to the recommended items. So it's huge boost to revenues. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> this recommendation concept doesn't just have to be applied to e-commerce. It can be applied to any platform. So Twitter, for example, mm. may recommend con content for you to read. Yeah. And what this does is it keeps you on the platform much longer. So it makes it more stickier. And then you end up seeing more of their ads. And when you see more ads, you may tend to click on it. So it indirectly increases revenues. Right. And uh, recommendation systems is can be used in different ways to like improve discovery, increase revenues. So you can position it in a lot of different ways. And uh, a nice thing about recommendation systems is it gives you room for experimentation. Right. There isn't one correct answer because you can recommend three things. One of it may look right. And even if the other two doesn't look right, it still looks okay. It's still the experience is still okay. Yeah. So it gives companies room for a lot of experimentation. Yeah. Yeah. And totally agree that, you know, it's a great impact for the organizations like Amazon. Uh, but I don't know for people like us, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, that I think there is that ethical side to how people use it. But, um, but yeah, from an organization perspective, it's a massive impact, right? Uh, yeah. So, knowing this impact, uh, how do you think, uh, you know, like someone listening to this, how can they prepare their organization for AI? Yeah. So, if you want to pilot AI initiatives today, you can. You absolutely can, and you should. But if you want AI to be part of your company's DNA and something within different business functions, then you have to look at the long-term AI preparation. And in my book, I describe five pillars of AI preparation. Right. And I would say the biggest pillar is the data pillar. So on, on the data side, there are many things um, to be looked at. The first is if you're collecting sufficient data. 
So some companies may be collecting some data, but not others. So they're not very aggressive about data collection. And this data that I'm referring to is like data from the daily running of your business, like your customer records, your employee records, so all of that need to be um, somehow collected. Right. And then you have um, big, uh, mid-sized to large companies also have their data stores in silos. Like data store from branch A may not know anything about the data store from branch B, although they may be collecting the same data points. Mm. So warehousing these data stores is very important for AI because otherwise it can perpetuate bias and a lot of um, uh, downstream problems can happen. And also by warehousing, you're going to prepare yourself for the future, essentially for analytics, reporting. It just prepares you for the long term. And some companies are still operating uh, using paper processes. Right. So if they can somehow digitize these paper processes, it's going to help with analytics and AI. Uh, so these are the three questions that you should be asking about the data side of things to get your data infrastructure in shape. Um, then another big pillar to consider is the cultural side of things. Now, when it comes to AI, you know there's a lot of fear and um, unsettling things about AI because there's misinformation uh, around, yeah. I mean, leveraging AI. Um, there's the fear of being replaced. There's all sorts of fears. So what this means is that there may be resistance within the company and also with your comp uh, with your customers. They may not want to use AI. Um, so one of the cultural elements that I recommend in my book is to provide AI literacy to your employees and customers. So explain to them what is this AI thing and how are you planning to use this in your organization? And what will you do and not do with AI, because that kind of reduces the anxiety around AI and makes them more likely to uh, use your AI solutions, really. Right. Um, then another cultural element I talk about is um, being prepared for uncertain outcomes. So as I mentioned earlier, AI solutions may or may not work. So there's a lot of uncertainty around it. So you'll have to always be prepared for an uncertain outcome and have a plan B in place at all times when it comes to AI. Um, so data and cultural readiness are one of the two biggest pillars uh, you should be focusing on um, today because those take time to implement. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've discussed other things that, which are easier to implement, like uh, infrastructure readiness. Right. So this can be done while you're piloting AI initiatives. Then the skills readiness, this can also be executed uh, quite easily because you have like online, um, the MOOCs essentially that teaches you mm. data science and all of that. Um, and to support all of this, of course, you need a budget. And that's one of the pillars I discuss in my book. Uh, but the nice thing is that if you know all your gaps, then you don't have to have a big budget to start with. You can phase things out based on your plan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned a mnemonic in the book called B-Kids, B-C-I-D-S. Uh, that's very interesting. Again, yes. I think read the book to you know look at all the pillars. So that's interesting. Um, so can you give one example of uh, people who have ex who actually implemented it? Like in the sense they have implemented these pillars uh, and how 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 the timeline looked like for them. It kind of differs based on what their gaps are. Okay. Um, so a lot of companies uh, may have gaps in some areas and not in others. Right. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, so the data readiness gaps, I say, would take the longest. Maybe if you're a big company, maybe one to two years. Um, the cultural readiness is something, it's an ongoing thing. 
Right. Um, you'll have to start sooner rather than later, but it's an ongoing process. Uh, the infrastructure readiness can take you three to six months, uh, depending on how aggressively you're experimenting with different platforms. Uh, skills, depending on what who's missing what skills, it can take several months to two years. Okay. Yeah. So it it's in it's in the realm of years, but I would say um, you can take small steps to get there small steps yeah and so you yeah. in that book you discuss how you can jump start ai in an organization like I, used, I think you mentioned four steps so can you share that sure yeah so the first step that i talk about is to identify your uh, readiness gaps right so using the b kids um pillars try to see where your gaps are so what so that will give you a sense of what you need to be focusing on when it comes to the long-term preparation for AI. Then you also need to understand where are the AI opportunities in your company? So if you don't have any AI opportunities, then why are you doing all these preparation steps? Right. So you'll have to understand your opportunities. Um, and you can look at um, legacy software automation, see if there's any accuracy problems with those, which you could, potentially replace with AI right. or you can look at um, things that you're doing currently very manually. So which requires a lot of decision-making and it's also high volume work that you're doing. So that can potentially be automated with AI and also look at your customer feedback. See if there's any software automation opportunity from based on your feedback. Um, and you'll find that a small percentage of the problems will be um, suitable for AI. So once you know where your gaps are, what the opportunities are within your company, then you can make a data-driven um, uh, plan yeah, okay, on how to, what to do next. So come up with a strategy essentially. Okay. So if you find that most of your AI opportunities are in customer service, so maybe you want to make customer service your key differentiator for your company for the long term. So using that as the basis, you can come up with your short term plans. So maybe execute one AI project the next year within customer service and close 10 to 20% of those gaps. And then as you meet your short term goals, you revise your long-term goals. Right. So that's essentially what I describe in the jumpstart AI approach. Yeah. And, you know, short-term, <clears throat> you have a lot of learnings which you can apply in your long-term and keep mm -hmm. keep improving as you grow, go, uh, go, right? So, yeah. So I, th I, I found those two things interesting in the sense that, you know, how do you prepare for AI as well as how do you jumpstart AI? And a lot of it is very common with, I think, many high technology, many, many, uh, high tech uh, things you do, uh, especially with automation, you know, the same things that you got to have in place when you start automation too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and probably that's a, a right approach, right? Um, so, so uh, you know, once you have a approach and things laid out, uh, how do people know that they're succeeding with AI? Yeah, so if you ask... Um... Different people who are part of the AI project, they'll tell you different things. Right. So data scientists will tell you uh, the model has to be completely accurate. So that's how we know AI is successful. Right. Uh, if you have a, ask a business leader, they may say, we want to see financial impact. So that's when we know it's successful. So they are both right. But um, AI success, I think, is made up of three main pillars. One is model success. The model has to do what it's uh, been tasked to do. Right. And and not just in development. It has to work both in development and once you've deployed it. Um, and model by itself is not the end. So model is a means to solving a business problem. So you need to be able to measure the business success. And business success is essentially what pain point the AI solution is trying to solve. So if you're trying to reduce the time to complete some task, 
then you should measure the uh, task completion time. And business success can be long-term success as well as short-term success. And you want to start off with these uh, short-term metrics uh, in the beginning and then keep tracking the longer-term metrics, like maybe financial metrics, maybe something you observe in the long-term. Um, then finally, once these two pillars are working extremely well, that's not the end. You, you've, you still have your users. The users are the consume, consumers of your AI output. And if the users don't see that your solution is helping them in any way, then the, you're going to have user adoption risks. So let's say you've deployed an AI solution, but the user has to take 10 additional steps to consume the AI output. So you've just introduced friction in their output, uh, in their workflow, sorry. And so they are not going to likely use this for the long term. They may just go back to their old way of doing things. So you still need to evaluate the user component. So you need to find out if they like the results, if they see this as a, a long-term solution and um, any issues with the output itself, because users may see things that a quantitative evaluation by data scientists may not catch, like some really simple issues. So that again goes back to, uh, so you basically iterate based on feedback from users okay. and to improve things, yeah. So these are the three pillars that have to be strong in order for you to see real AI success. Okay, yeah. And so, you know, just coming in full circle, that's the business case, right? In the sense that people are using it and people are seeing results from it. So, uh, you know, it's it's been an evolution. AI has gone through so many winters. Uh, it seems like summer right now. Uh, what's your what's your take on AI in general? Uh, you know, uh, where is it going? Would we soon see another winter, or we 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 are going towards general intelligence? Where are we going? Um, I think from the business angle, it's essentially summer is just starting. Okay. Businesses have barely scratched the surface in using AI, and there's a lot of uh, AI startups coming up just in healthcare, in manufacturing. I'm seeing a lot of startups uh, sprout to solve uh, important business challenges. But on the research side of things, they are trying to get to a state where AI can perform like human-like common sense reasoning. Right. So maybe we may hit some bumps there, but maybe in 20 to 30 years, AI systems can reason like us in a general sense. But yeah, that's going to take some time. So I think one important thing to mention is that there should be a clear distinction that what's applicable in business may not relate to what's happening in the research world. So we are consuming all the research results, but the research will hit its um, uh, bumps and make progress. And then some of those results will come back to the business side of things. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So use the practical aspects that you have, right? Practical now, right? aspects. Yeah. 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 So now one of the things about AI is that, yeah, as it becomes more practical and as people start using it uh, is the whole ethical consideration. I think we discussed sometime back too, is the whole ethics of AI uh, and, you know, how do we ensure that that you know that humanity is, is is itself not impacted by AI, right? Because it's such a powerful technology right now. So, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, I think what businesses can do on the ethics side is take a stance on how they will and will not use the AI because it impacts people uh, in the end. Right. So, what kind of applications will you never ever develop? Like. Maybe you'll never use facial recognition systems because it has known problems to it. And also on the development side, the team should know what kind of data sources they are consuming because those data sources may have ingrained biases in them, right. which AI will eventually perpetuate. So once you know what is the uh, potential biases, then you can find ways to mitigate, mitigate those biases. And also evaluation is a very big part of the equation. So you need 
ideally you should have an external team to test this AI solutions in different ways and really try to see what are the potential problems this AI system can perpetuate. Um, so you have, you'll have an inkling before it goes out into production. And that's what businesses can do by themselves. Okay. Yeah. And you talked about facial recognition, you know, as we speak, you know, one yeah. guy has taken the massive database of uh, videos uh, we have and he has created one software where, you know, police can go look up anyone <laughs> out oh. there. So, <laughs> so I think, yeah, I mean, you know, there needs to be a lot of regulation, but at least at an enterprise perspective, like you say, mm. you know, people should think of the ethical consideration first. And as you spoke about the whole cultural aspect of it, uh, that's something to share with employees that how you are taking care of that so that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, it's not impacting the employees, it's people first, it's humans first, uh, and uh, yeah. AI it helping humans. Uh, so, so thank you today for being on the show, Kavita. It was great chatting with you. So Yeah, thank people... you very much for having me. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're welcome. And if people want to find and connect with you, what's a good place? Uh, you can visit my website uh www.kavita k a v i t a dash ganesan g a n e s a n dot com so you'll find information about my books and about me in general and you're welcome to join my ai integrated mailing list oh, okay uh, yeah i send out tips uh on a bi-weekly basis okay okay very good very good and i think on your website you have a sample chapter or something out there too right yes i chapter. have uh, three sample oh. uh, chapters you, that you can download yeah yeah you can download three three sample chapters and go through it okay uh, again thank you so much kavita it was great chatting with you